Okay, so today um, we have the pleasure to have uh, Miguel Bello uh, here to give the next uh, big seminar. Um, Miguel did his uh, PhD in Madrid in the Material Science Institute uh, and now is uh, working as a postdoc in the Max Planck Institute for Quantum Optics and today he is going to talk us about quantum impurity problems. So, uh, Miguel, the stage is yours. Okay, hi Carlos and hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and letting me present my work. And yeah, please interrupt me at any moment if you have questions. I, I've tried to be as pedagogical as possible, but I don't know, some of the things might be trivial to you, some things might be uh, not trivial at all, and uh, I would like some input during the talk. Okay, so... In the beginning of quantum optics, we were concerned with very simple systems, and we wanted to understand what is the basic interaction between light and matter. So, for example, we, look, uh, we looked at atoms in free space, uh, we studied uh, how to quantize the electromagnetic field, uh, what are the possible states of the electromagnetic field, is there such a thing as quantum states of light? And, and we came up with uh, uh, some theory that is uh, very interesting and very useful nowadays. So for example, uh, one could argue that uh, the development of the laser uh, uh, occurred because of this research. And also we understood basic things such as spontaneous uh, atomic decay and photon emission and things like that. So now um, this field has exploded and uh, there is a huge variety of, of very different light matter interfa interfaces. So we are not only talking about atoms interacting with light, but maybe some microscopic degrees of freedom. And one example is uh, here, superconducting circuits, in which one uses quantum mechanics to describe uh, the interaction of, for example, the current in the circuit or the phase of the circuit with the electromagnetic environment. And uh, in general, one could say that the the complexity of the systems that we are studying now uh, has increased a lot. And this is a challenge for us theoreticians, but it's also an opportunity because um, we can start thinking about uh, developing applications with, uh, with these systems. And people nowadays uh, try to do quantum information processing, quantum error correcting, uh, quantum simulation, uh, meteorological applications, and and yes, all, all this is possible because now we have uh, the ability to build these systems in the lab. Um, right. So now going uh, in, in this direction, in, instead of talking about um, simple environments such as the electromagnetic field in, in vacuum, uh, we are looking at uh, structure paths. And in general, in this talk, I will discuss uh, impurity problems. So. These, these type of systems are shown schematically here in this slide, and they are composed of two subsystems. One of them is the atomic subsystem, and it's represented here with some um, blue circles, which are atoms or impurities. And you can think of them as two level systems with a ground state and an excited state. And the photonic environment, which in this case is uh, complex in some sense uh, is represented here by this uh, line of dots and it's modeled with some tight binding Hamiltonian for bosons. So this uh, in, in reality in an experiment would be, for example, a photonic crystal or uh, an array of cavities or reson superconducting resonators. And it has some non-trivial dispersion relation and, and is characterized by some block Hamiltonian. And then the two subsystems are coupled to each other, to each other with the usual James Cummings uh, type of interaction. So the, the atoms or impurities are coupled locally to the modes in this structure path, such that they can emit a photon and become the excited, or they can absorb a photon from the cavity and become excited. Okay, so... How do we study these systems or, or how can we study them? One approach is uh, the so-called master equation. And this has been developed since many years ago and theory is, is very standard. So here I will just try to briefly sketch how, 
how this master equation goes about. And the idea is that if the coupling between your subsystem and in this case, the subsystem of interest is going to be the impurities or the atoms and your environment is weak, then you, and you don't care about the environment degrees of freedom, you can somehow trace them out and arrive to an equation that describes the evolution of the subsystem of interest. And to do so, you start uh, with the Heisenberg equation of motion for the density matrix of the entire system. You can uh, integrate this equation once and plug it back in to, to arrive to this uh, integral differential equation. And here you can do uh, what is known as the Born approximation. So this approximation consists in assuming that the state of your entire system, there is no entanglement between the subsystem and the environment. And uh, what this uh, means uh, in mathematical terms is that your density matrix factorizes as this. And if there is any correction to this, uh, the, it is going to be of the order of the uh, interaction. And now if you compute what is the evolution of, of your reduced uh, system, uh, density matrix of, of the system of interest up to second order, you get this uh, equation, this integral differential equation. And this is still very hard to solve because uh, as you can see, the state, the, the evolution of your state uh, depends on the past evolution of, of your state. And one way to, to solve this is, okay, let's say that uh, we have this type of interaction Hamiltonian in the interaction picture. So this is uh, very canonical. It's just a bilinear form of system operators and bath operators. And then if you plug this back into this expression, you see that essentially you get some, some integrals that are controlled by correlation functions of the bath. So for the type of James Cummings type of interaction that I was describing before, um, these correlation functions tell you how the excitations in the path evolve. So this could be, for example, the creation of a photon in a cavity at time t prime and the annihilation of a photon at a later time t in your environment. And now one makes the assumption that these correlation functions decay very fast, much faster than the typical system dynamics. So, and th this is a very natural assumption. So imagine that you have your atoms and they are weakly coupled to the path. Then the evolution due to this coupling to the path, if the coupling is small, is going to be very slow. If the coupling rate is very small, your atom will emit very slowly, for example. And, and then mathematically, what this means is that, okay, let's, if you approximate these functions, by delta functions, for example, one can replace in this expression the reduced density matrix of the system of interest at any time t prime with the one at the current state. And this is the Markov approximation. And it uh, let us arrive to a form that is the following one. And it's uh, very simple and very useful. So in particular, when the, we assume that the bath is always in the vacuum state, the master equation has uh, these three terms. So the first term is just uh, giving you the coherent evolution of the Hamiltonian of your impurities. The second term in orange corresponds to some effective dipole-dipole interactions that are mediated by this structure path. And then the third term uh, corresponds to dissipation and decoherence induced by the coupling to the path. And now just to... To give you some examples, um, here uh, I, I show you what is the actual expression of these coefficients of the master equation, these j, m, n, and gamma, m, n. They uh, turn out to be the real and imaginary part of uh, a complex function, which is this, the self-energy. And for the case of a simple one-dimensional bath, the self-energy, for, for the case of a single band bath, the self-energy can be computed in this way. And what I want to say with this is that the, it is very easy to compute uh, analytically. And for example, here in, in the plot on the right, I show you what is the expression of these coefficients. For example, if you have two atoms, atom one and atom two, what is the, the effective dipole coupling, this J12, and the effective uh, decay rate of the two. And you can see, for example, if you have a path with a band that spans the range of frequencies from 
zero to four J, uh, the let's say the dissipative part is non-zero only when your emitters, the, the tuning of your emitters is resonant with the band. And on the other hand, if you if your emitters are spectrally tuned outside the band range, um, the only part that is non-zero is going to be these affective couplings. Okay. So let's now look in in detail at this effective interact bath mediated interaction. What is the, the physical origin of these interactions? Well, it is bound states. So a bound state is just a, a state in which your atom is mostly excited, but there is some probability to find a photon around it in the environment. And now you can imagine that if you place two emitters sufficiently close to each other, such that these um, photonic uh, components overlap, there is a non-zero probability that the, the two are able to exchange excitations to, virtually through these uh, bound states. But since we have a lot of um, tools to, to analyze this, and we can say a lot about these bound states. And uh, in particular, what I said before is that, yeah, these are eigenstates of your, let's say, single particle sector of your Hamiltonian. And because they are single particle states, we can try to find an ansatz for them or find an explicit form for the wave function. And it turns out that the energy of these bound states just satisfies this equation where the self energy enters here and the coefficients of, of this superposition. So this would correspond to the probability of finding the emitter in the excited state, whereas this part here is the, the part of the bound state that corresponds to the photonic component. They also have analytic expressions in terms of the self energy and their derivative. And um, well, in this simple case, the, the energy of the bound state controls everything. So for a fixed energy that I can find solving this equation, I also know what is the shape of the bound state because the energy is, fixes uh, all the coefficients. And now, um, uh, if we compute for this particular example, what are the what is the spectrum? We have a continuum of scattering eigenstates shown here uh, in gray. Here, this dashed line corresponds to the frequency of my emitter. And now I show you the, um, what is the energy of these bound states as, as a function of the coupling strength. And you can see that there are two bound states, one below and another above the band of the path and their energies diverge as a function of the coupling strength. And not only that, uh, in general, we can say that uh, for energies very far away from the continuum, uh, this photonic component will be very localized. And this is what is shown here. So here uh, you can see what is the decay length of, of these tails of this photonic cloud. And as you increase the coupling strength, this um, decay length goes to zero. So meaning that the photonic part becomes very localized. And the reason is that the energy of the bound state is also uh, separating from the, the continuum. But there are other types of bound states that are also very interesting in particular, uh, what uh, is called vacancy-like bound states uh, that uh, were described uh, quite recently although general bound states are known since many, many years ago. And to explain them, I will use this example of uh, an atom coupled to the SSH model. So the SSH model uh, is a type binding model that has some non-trivial topology, and it is characterized by this alternating uh, pattern of hopping amplitudes. Um, so now the, the idea is that if instead of an emitter, you had a vacancy, so you create a hole in the path. Uh, this would split the chain into subchains, and one of them would be in the trivial phase, and the other one would be in the topological one. And the topological one supports a, a state that is outside the continuum. So this model has two bands, uh, but the edge state appears in the gap between the two bands. Um, and this is what I mean with this expression here. No? So the, there is this vacancy mode that is a topological edge state that is an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian when you have open boundary conditions. And now it turns out that if you place an emitter 
and you tune the energy of the emitter to the energy of this vacancy mode, you, this emitter can see a vacancy light bound state, which is just a superposition of this vacancy mode and some probability of finding the emitter excited. And mathematically, these vacancy modes show up as zeros of the self energy, and they have an interesting property. So, for example, their energy is independent of the coupling strength. And this is very different uh, with the behavior I showed to you before. So, here in the SSH model, in, in this example, I have two bands, so these two gray regions, and now I place the energy of my emitter in the middle of the gap. And then you see that there are three bound states. Two of them have energies that diverge and they are like regular bound states, but there is another one here in the middle whose energy is constant. And because it's constant, the shape of the bound state is also constant. It doesn't depend on the coupling strength. And well, this was one of the first examples in which we understood that topolo the topology of the path can have some implications for the quantum optical properties of, of your emitters coupled to such paths. But these vacancy-like bound states, is, it's a very general concept. So I want to move now to a non-Hermitian system. So non-Hermitian systems are systems whose Hamiltonian is non-Hermitian. And this is, for example, a, a model for a photonic lattice with uh, on-site loss. And, and in one of the interesting features of, of these non-permission systems is that they can have some topological effects that are um, very different from the ones found in, in regular Hermitian systems. So here, uh, I just showed the example of the hatano nelson model. This is a tight binding chain in which we only have hopping to the right. So the Hermitian conjugate counterpart is, is absent. And there is also on-site loss. And we need this on-site loss such that the spectrum of the whole system has negative imaginary part. And this means essentially this is a technical condition so that the whole system is stable. Otherwise, we may have some probabilities that blow up in time. But OK, so uh, if we now compute the spectrum of this chain with periodic boundary conditions, the spectrum has this form. and it, it's just a circle in the complex energy plane in blue. But now if we have open boundary conditions, uh, you can realize that the, the Hamiltonian of the path in the single particle sector is just a Jordan block with a single eigenvalue that is minus i. And so you see here that the spectrum with open boundary conditions is just this point and it changes dramatically depending on the boundary conditions. And on, also the only eigenstate is this state here, which is completely localized to the first side of the chain. So this is what is known as the skin effect. And essentially it means that the spectrum uh, changes with the boundary conditions and that all your eigen, there is a macroscopic localization of your eigenstates. Um, sorry, uh, an extensive localization of, of your state. So all your states in your spectrum become localized. And it's a topological effect. It happens whenever the dispersion relation for your path with periodic boundary conditions has loops in the complex plane. And this can be characterized by a topological invariant, which is the winding number. So now we realize that this type of vacancy-like bound states uh, also show up in, in this hatano nelson model. So if, if we have an emitter, depending on where we place the, the tuning of our emitter, so the emitter uh, can have a complex detuning, meaning that it has some frequency and some natural decay rate. Well, if it's inside the, this loop, here the self-energy vanishes identically, so you get what is known as a skin-like bound state. And on the other hand, there are also bound states outside this loop that have features that are similar to the regular bound states that I described previously, whereas the one that are a skin-like, uh, they are similar to this vacancy-like bound state. So the decay length is constant. Also here, uh, interestingly, they decay towards the left. So even if, if your chain has hopping to the right, this bound state decay has a photonic component that decays to the left. And this will have some consequences that I will explain later with some other example. And um, yes, they, they, for example, can be observed in dynamics of, of this system. So I don't have time to go into the details here, but you can check um, our papers. 
So another example of vacancy-like bound states are subravian, subravian states. So if you have now two emitters and you place vacancies instead of emitters, you have uh, you cut the chain, and and then uh, whenever you your emitters are resonant with eigenmodes of this middle part, you will have a, a subradian state, which is also known as bound states in the continuum. And these type of bound states are also relevant, for example, if you consider giant atoms, because giant atoms can have bound states in the continuum that are nothing but this type of uh, vacancy-like bound states. So why do I spend so much time talking about bound states? Well, it's just to sh uh, not just because they're interesting, but uh, people have come up with many applications. In particular, one is quantum simulation. So uh, now we understand very well how, by tuning the properties of the path, you can tune the effective interactions. And, and the idea is to use uh, such setups of quantum emitters coupled to let's say waveguides or any structured environment to simulate spin models. So once you trace out the path degrees of freedom, uh, you have uh, some spin model that may have some interesting many body properties. And here in particular, we analyze this for the case of the SSH model. And we, we discuss some ground state many body phases uh, with some dimerization that comes from the peculiar properties of the bound states. But also uh, other people, in particular people in the group of uh, Quantum Info in Madrid, uh, they show that you can harness these effective dipole-dipole interactions to implement, for example, quantum variational algorithms. And that this uh, tunability of the range of the interactions uh, is very useful. And, and in fact, it, it gives you some advances uh, for this platform versus other platforms in which you could also implement these algorithms. No? And uh, these things are not just like a theoretical um, endeavor, but there is it's also an, an experimental effort in, in building systems where one exploits these interactions. So here I show you an example of um, superconducting metamaterial. So here in blue, you have uh, a resonator array. And in orange, we, you have some transform qubits. And by tuning the, the, the tuning of these qubits, you can tune the range of interactions and people in the group of Oscar Painter have used this system to study, for example, the onset of ergodicity in a uh, Bose-Hubbard model. Here in, in this uh, work by the group of William Oliver, they, they build these giant atoms in a superconducting circuit, where even though you have uh, qubits resonant with the, with the frequencies of this uh, resonator, of, of this waveguide, you can have some coherent interactions between them due to these uh, bound states in the continuum that I told you about before. And there are other platforms such as uh, purely atomic ones. So in the group of Dominic Schnerl, they do a kind of uh, analog simulation of these quantum emitter systems. And they, for example, explore um, what are the, the properties of um, interacting polariton gases. So these polaritons are also these bound states uh, for these atomic systems that have similar physics as the bound states that I was describing before. But the, the interesting thing of this experiment is that in addition to, to what I told you, there are some interactions, non-trivial interactions between them. And uh, yeah, this is very hard to simulate or, or to understand uh, theoretically, numerically. So. One of the works uh, that we did recently, uh, we tried to, to under, uh, we asked this question. So if you give me a structured environment with certain topology, what can I say about the topology of the photon mediated interactions between the emitters? And this is a very general question. Uh, so we, we need some constraints to be able to say something meaningful. Uh, but it is possible to say something meaningful about this question. So the assumptions are that, okay, we have weak coupling, we have atoms in a band gap, and if you have some periodicity, then your atomic Hamiltonian will, the effective uh, atomic Hamiltonian will also be periodic. And in particular, if you have one emitter per resonator, then there is a very simple expression relating the block Hamiltonian of your atoms and the block Hamiltonian of your photonic system. 
And this expression, you can get it uh, using perturbation theory to second order, for example. So now, given this mapping, uh, what can we say about the topology of this atomic Hamiltonian if I know the, if you give me some particular photonic Hamiltonian? Well, we found uh, a very simple answer and a very elegant one, which is that there is either topology preservation or topology pre reversal, meaning that the topological invariants that characterize your system are either the same for the atomic and the photonic subsystems, or they are the opposite. And I want to focus now on the, we'll give you some examples of the, of the case in which there is topology reversal, because I think uh, it's the, the more striking case. So here, uh, uh, let's consider a photonic keywood sign lattice. So this is a two-dimensional topological insulator. And it's an example of a churn insulator. So it's a Hermitian system in two dimensions and it has uh, chiral edge states. So here in this schematic picture, this uh, gray plane would be this uh, photonic lattice. And if you have some periodic boundary conditions uh, along Y and open boundary conditions along X and you plot the spectrum, you will see that there are two bands uh, and you plot it as a function of the momentum uh, along Y. There are two bands, but there are also states that appear in the gap. And these are the photonic edge states. And in this case, we have uh, the phenomenon of topology reversal. And what this implies is that if you now couple one emitter to every cavity of this photonic environment, and you look at what are the what is the topology, it has the opposite chart number. And this means that the chiral edge states, they run in the opposite direction. So in this spectrum, which is in fact the spectrum of the whole system, so the path with the emitters, if we zoom in at the, at the gap, we see some um, atomic bands, and there are some atomic edge states that have the opposite chirality. And now another example, in this case, in the non-Hermitian context, is that of the hatano nelson photonic lattice. So the topological invariant in this case is the winding of the complex energy dispersion relation. And for the hatano nelson model, if let's say that you have right, uh, rightward uh, hopping stronger than leftward hopping, you will have a dispersion relation that winds clockwise in the complex energy plane. But if you compute what is the dispersion relation of your atomic uh, subsystem, it winds around counterclockwise in the complex energy plane. And the consequence of this is that the skin effect is the opposite in both subsystems. So for the atomic subsystem, uh, sorry, for the photonic subsystem, your eigenstates localize to the right. And for the atomic subsystem, they localize to the left. And if you remember what are the properties of these skin-like bound states that I told you about before, you see that they decay towards the opposite uh, uh, direction uh, of the hopping. And this is the one can think of this as the physical reason why the localization is like somehow the the effective atomic uh, model is a Hatana Nelson model with uh, leftward hopping stronger than rightward hopping. Okay, so all everything I've discussed so far is physics in the of bound states, so mostly in the in the gap. And now I want to move towards physics in the in the band. So what happens when the, the emitters are resonant with the guided, mo guided modes of the path and they decay collectively in this uh, path? And this is a, a very interesting problem that has been studied um, since many years. And in, in particular, I want to point out the work by Dike. So he described for the first time the, the effect of super radiance. And this happens whenever you have a bunch of atoms that decay collectively to the same mode of the electromagnetic field. So for example, you can think of an, an atomic cloud that is very much confined. So the atoms are all of them almost sitting on the same point in space. This is just you know, some um, mathematical uh, possibility. In reality, uh, this is very hard to accomplish. But the, the phenomenon is that if, if all of them decay to the same mode, then uh, the emission rate will show a peak and the height of this peak 
increases uh, with n squared, where n is the number of atoms. So the more atoms you, you have, the faster they decay. And this is the concept of super radiance. And it's still very relevant nowadays. So for example, people uh, are still looking at, at this problem. And in particular, uh, Ana Senjo Garcia has looked as, at atomic arrays. So these are order configurations of atoms in free space. And the peculiarity is that uh, the distance between these atoms is of the order of the wavelength of the transition, more or less. And then she realized that this phenomenon of super radiance still can take place, even if all the atoms are not very close to each other, but they are extended, if you have this sort of uh, periodicity. And uh, okay, this motivated us to, to think about the following question. What happens with fermions? Is it possible to have fermionic super radiance? And also another motivation was, uh, the development of, let's say, matter wave quantum optics. So this is a, a proposal. Matter wave quantum optics is a proposal by Ignacio and other people in which they use atoms um, to simulate this Hamiltonian of quantum emitters in structured environments. So if you remember the example of Dominic Schnibel, in which they analyze the physics of polaritons in atomic uh, clouds trapped in optical lattices, this is the same. The, the essential idea is that you can have uh, state-dependent optical lattices such that uh, one internal state of your atom is very tightly trapped, whereas there is another internal state that is very lightly trapped. And now you can use some Raman scheme to couple these two states. And in this way, you realize uh, the, the kind of models that I've been discussing, that I've been talking about. So if your atom is in this internal state A, it is tightly trapped, it doesn't move, and it corresponds to an impurity excited. Uh, but if it goes to the internal state B, it is free to propagate, and it behaves as a photon in this structured environment. And now the, the cool thing is that with uh, atomic physics, you can play with the flavor of, of your atoms and you can consider bosonic atoms, in which case you will realize something similar to um, photonic structures, but you can also use fermionic atoms. And this is a fundamental difference because the particle statistics uh, will be completely different, right? So now the type of, of models that I, Want to talk about is uh, shown here. So this is an impurity, fermionic impurity system. So these C operators are creation and annihilation operators of fermions at your impurity sites. These uh, B are fermionic creation and annihilation operators in your bath, which is characterized by some dispersion relation. And they are coupled to each other with some uh, tunnel type of coupling. So you can, uh, remove a fermion from the path and create it at an impurity site and the other way around. So, okay, this problem is very well known. It's just a, a free fermion problem. And in condensed matter physics, this has been studied a lot. So what can we say about it? Well, it turns out that there are many things that uh, have been overlooked. And I want to convince you of that in the following slides. So first I will review a little bit the formalism on how one can study these fermionic systems. So let's consider a set of fermionic creation and annihilation operators that fulfill some canonical anti-commutation relations. And then we have the concept of a Fox state. So a Fox state is just a product state uh, in which uh, different fermionic modes can be either occupied or empty. So these occupation numbers in the case of fermions are, are either zero or one. But uh, if we had bosons instead, these occupation numbers could be whatever, any positive uh, integer. Now, how do these creation and annihilation operators act on these Fox states? Well, they do what you would expect. Essentially, the annihilation operator uh, would either kill your state if you have no fermion, or if you have a fermion in, in the i-th mode, you would get another state that has this fermion removed. And the creation operator does the opposite. The only peculiarity of fermionic systems is that here we have 
In the definition of the Fox states, we have fixed some order of the fermionic operators. So this means that whenever we act uh, with uh, an operator, there is a sign here that accounts for the parity of the of some of these modes. No? So essentially, yeah, mm, th there is a phase that can be either plus one or minus one, and this is very easy to, to understand and to compute. Now, uh, I will just, uh, be concerned with one body operator. So one body operators are operators that have this form. Um, they are quadratic in terms of creation and annihilation operators and these coefficients. They depend on the basis that you use for, for these modes. So these coefficients are nothing but the single particle matrix elements of your operator. And now if you want to compute a matrix element in a many body state, in a Fox state, or for example, this expectation value, uh, if, if this state is written in the same basis, then it is very easy to compute. You just have to add up all the diagonal terms uh, of the modes that are uh, corresponding to modes that are occupied. And if you have uh, a quadratic free Hamiltonian, such as the one that I showed you before, uh, it's also very easy to understand what are the dynamics produced by this Hamiltonian because you can diagonalize it uh, very easily. Uh, you have here some single particle uh, Hamiltonian and you can diagonalize it, find the single particle eigenmodes, and then your many body eigenmodes will be Fox states in, in this uh, particular basis. So in particular, the ground state is just a Fox state in which you occupy all the mo modes with an energy below certain uh, certain energy that we call the Fermi level. And if I want to compute expectation values of one body operators in the ground state, then I can do this very easily. I just have to add up all the single particle matrix elements of my Fox state. Okay, so I mean, I explained all this such that the, the following will be easier to understand. We can do the same thing uh, as before and work out um, Markovian master equation. For example, for the case in which your bath is in a Fermi C state. And essentially we get the, a very similar master equation. So we have some effective Hamiltonian. Here I've also included these effective interactions that in this case uh, correspond to effective hopping between the impurities. And interestingly, it turns out that the coupling, the, the effective hopping uh, rates are the same as the ones that we computed uh, or for the bosonic system. So in this case, there is no difference between fermions and bosons. But there are two terms here that are dissipative uh, or incoherent, and they correspond to emission and absorption. So the um, let's consider emission first. Uh, this is uh, the, the reason why you would have emission is because, okay, your impurities have an energy that is above the Fermi level. And this means that the bath has modes that are empty and are resonant with your impurities such that your impurities can emit and, and occupy this, these empty modes. On the other hand, you can have absorption and this only occurs whenever your impurities have an energy that is below the Fermi level. So if the impurities are below the Fermi level, they cannot emit anything because there are not no modes available at that at those frequencies. And instead what they can do is they can absorb uh, fermions from the path. But uh, this master equation has a problem. And, and one of the problem is that if you remember in the derivation, I told you that you need to have this separation of time scales between the path dynamics and system dynamics. And that you need to be able to approximate these bath correlation functions um, with, uh, with something similar to a delta function. And this fails, for example, at the Fermi level. At the Fermi level, the distribution of uh, particles in your path has a discontinuity. So we need other techniques to understand the dynamics in this system. And we can do so because uh, using the, the tools of quantum optics. So uh, in particular, we will use Gaussian states and the resolvent formalism. And the, the key realization is that fermionic Fox states are Gaussian states. And any quadratic Hamiltonian preserves Gaussianity, meaning that the, uh, it, the Gaussian state will evolve into another Gaussian state. And these Gaussian states are essentially states um, 
that are fully characterized by the one body correlation functions. So here, for example, the correlation matrix. Uh, essentially, a Gaussian state is a state that fulfills uh, this theorem. So any higher order correlation can be factorized into uh, smaller order correlations. So to characterize this, the state completely, we only need to compute the evolution of this correlation matrix. And if you, you look at how these uh, operators evolve, you realize that essentially this correlation matrix evolves with the uh, time evolution operator within the single particle sector. So here, these, uh, these are single particle transition amplitudes that can be computed analytically using the resolvent formalism. And in this way, we can compute the dynamics exactly. So let's look at some results. Imagine that I have an initial state that is a Fermi C with an impurity occupied. And then I look at the impurity occupation as a function of time. So this impurity can emit a fermion, so it can decay to the ground state or it can remain occupied. And, and if we look at, for example, the prediction of the master equation, we would get this uh, step function so the impurity becomes empty only when it's within the band and above the Fermi level. And if not, you would have uh, the impurity will remain always occupied. But if you compute the dynamics exactly, you get this, this smearing out of the step function. And there is some fractional decay here that we can understand very well. And this is some non-Markovian dynamics. Now we also looked at uh, multi-impurity dynamics, and we are trying now to solve this, this question that I posed initially of, is there supervariance for fermions? And the short answer is no. So what happens is that in general, if you start with a fully inverted state, the impurity occupation will, will evolve with this expression. Uh, it doesn't matter much uh, the exact meaning of it, what, uh, what it uh, turns out to be is some kind of multi-exponential decay that is shown here in this uh, black line. And because we, we can compute the dynamics exactly, we can also look at retardation effects and fractional decay. So here you can see that for uh, increasing distance between the impurities, the impurities first evolve as if they were independent, so they decay with some decay rate, but then they uh, converge towards the result of the master equation. Also, if you place the impurities in the decay regime, uh, which is when uh, the distance is resonant with the wavelength of a uh, standing wave between the impurities, uh, your master equation becomes the decay master equation or the analogous fermionic uh, decay ma master equation. And there is a single bright mode. And because of fermionic statistics, this bright mode can be occupied at most by one fermion. So what happens is that the at most, you can only emit one fermion. And this is what you observe here. The total impurity occupation for five impurities only decays until four, up to four impurities, according to the master equation. In reality, we observe some uh, further decay, and this can be explained uh, using these bound states in the continuum. So we can use all the, all the formalism that we developed for quantum emitters in structured bath to work out what is the single particle eigen spectrum of, of this impurity problem and use this information to compute, to say something about the many body dynamics. And it is very intuitive here that um, in, in this Zika regime, what happens is that you have these uh, bound states in the continuum and then fermions can be trapped in these bound states in the continuum and they quench the dynamics. Uh, so there is no full decay, but the, the longer the distance, the, the smaller the overlap with these bound states in the continuum and the more you can decay. And uh, there are yeah many more results that I don't have time to explain, uh, but if you're interested, you can check our work here. So to sum up, um, I hope I have convinced you that this increasing complexity is uh, very interesting because it offers new avenues for developing novel applications, but also for exploring new physics. Also, we need uh, more advanced methods of theoretical tools to understand the, these more complicated systems. For, for example, to it's very hard to simulate non-Markovian dynamics or to understand what happens in interacting bats, for example. 
And also using this um, perspective from quantum optics, uh, we can explore models that so far have been looked only in, in certain parameter re regimes. So for example, this impurity problem uh, that I talked about uh, last has been studied in condensed matter, but mostly in the wide band limit and people didn't care about bound states and anything like that. And we found a physical system in which these uh, things are relevant because you can, for example, have a small bandwidth and, and reach other parameter regimes that are, are not natural in other setups. So it is very interesting to consider all, all this variety of, of uh, setups so we can now play uh, and it's a, a very interesting playground for us theoreticians. So, okay, with this, I finish and I thank you for your attention and also all my collaborators and I'm happy to receive questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, okay, sorry, it looks like we have some coupling. Um, okay, maybe now? No. Okay. Maybe no. Okay. I ho hopefully, hopefully. Uh, okay. Uh, now, please, uh, anyone in the audience, feel free to 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 ask any questions. And by the way, Miguel, thank you for the very nice presentation. Okay. Uh, maybe I can start. Uh, I I like very much the. Uh, the explanation of the skin-like uh, bound states, and I would like to ask you if um, is there any relation of this uh, of the structure of this uh, skin-like uh, bound states with the uh, with an emission topological invariant? Yeah. So in in fact, um, so. If you remember these bound states, vacancy-like bound states correspond mm. to zeros of the self-energy. Mm. And in this work, we are able to show that inside this, uh, this circle, mm. so in the complex plane where you have a non-zero winding number of the complex dispersion relation, mm. your self-energy has to vanish. So this mm. is a link between the topological invariant, which in this case would be the winding of the dispersion relation, yeah, exactly. With the presence of these uh, bound states. Yeah, yeah. It's true that, like, like in this non emission system, in case, uh, like you define the, the winding number is, is like a spectral, right? Uh, yes. Or the, the uh, gene value structure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Uh, and is there, uh, what you talk about this uh, observation of, of uh, experimental setups to observe uh, bound states, is there any prospect or work done towards the observation of? of these uh, non emission bound states? Um, well, not that I am aware of. So, okay. okay. I mean, the, these um, non hermitian systems are, are not necessarily quantum. And people have come up with many different setups in which you can explore non hermitian physics, um, regular circuits, uh, I know. And, and it would be interesting, in my opinion, to to try to demonstrate them experimentally, you know, and also maybe to come up with some applications of this type of uh, bound states. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, is there any question from the audience? Uh, I just had one clarification. So, hello. Yeah. Hey, hello. Yeah. Uh, I just had one small clarification. Uh, when you said uh, about the tunneling in the impure slide, which one has the impurity, uh, uh, electron impurity. So, when you say uh, the tunneling, tunneling, is it about the uh, like a columbic trap? So it can tunnel that kind of trap uh, tunneling. Yes, Sorry, I didn't understand the question. Uh, uh, I wanted to ask about this tunneling, pro tunneling coefficient. Yeah, in this like. 
So the the coupling between the two internal states. No, the impurity from the impurity. Um, so the, I mean, in in this fermionic setup, the impurity is uh, defined by the internal state of the atom, and the way it is coupled to the bath is by some Raman tr transition. So you, in principle, could have um, a lambda level scheme and two lasers, and if you drive them the atoms of resonantly, they can hop from one internal state to the other, and this would give you. Uh, this kind of hopping between the impurity. So imagine that you do this uh, Raman laser locally at a single spot in your optical lattice, you would define yes. at that particular spot uh, of an impurity that could be occupied or could be empty. And I, I don't know, in the photonic setup, sometimes it's just uh, like the connectivity of your of your system no so here in the superconducting uh resonator array you just couple a transmond with capacitively or i don't know exactly the details but in some way to the resonator in your structured bath yeah, I'm thank sure you. if i ex uh uh answered your question or not yeah good thank you Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, may, maybe we have time for another question. Okay, so uh, it doesn't look like. Uh, so uh, I would like to thank again uh, Miguel. It was a very nice in, uh, uh, talk, very pedagogical. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And thank you all for attending uh, this seminar. And hope to see you in the in the next seminar next month. Yeah. Bye. Bye.